We're here in Cambridge at Microsoft Research to chat with Professor Simon Peyton Jones, Chair and Founder of Computing at School, Principal Researcher here at Microsoft Research, Advisor to Ministers and Co-Inventor of Haskell. And we're going to be talking about algorithmic efficiency and algorithmic complexity and the notion that some algorithms actually are better than other algorithms. Simon, thank you ever so much for your time this afternoon. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, so we want to talk a little about algorithmic efficiency, algorithmic complexity, the notion that some algorithms do rather seem to be better than other algorithms. Even in real world contexts, there seem to be many algorithms to solve the same problem, some of which do seem to be better than others. What sort of examples would you use to illustrate that point? Oh yes, well here's, a, here's a, um, a very simple algorithm you might do. If you're looking up a number in a telephone book, one thing you might do is you might, you're looking up uh, J, uh, Smith or Jane, Jane Smith and you might start at page one and you'd run through that page. Any Jane Smith there? No, you turn over the page and you run down the next page. Any Jane Smith there? You turn over the next page. You would get Jane Smith in the end, but it would take you a long time and nobody in their right mind would do that. What would they do? They would instead kind of open the book in the middle and say, oh, that's the, the Mannings, all right, so I need the second half of the book. And then they'd open in the middle of that half and then they've gone too far now, so they go back. So they sort of navigate their way to Jane Smith. And you can figure out that not only that that will be faster, but then you can say a lot about how much faster it is. Um, Here's another completely different kind of example. If you want to find your way um, uh, across London um, from uh, you know, King's Cross to Waterloo, one thing you could do would be to um, uh, just start off and randomly take turnings, uh, just whenever the feeling took you. And eventually, one day, you would probably end up at Waterloo. You might be very old, but you probably would. Uh, another way would, might be to say, if you knew how, f how distance, how far you were as the crow flies from Waterloo, you might always take a turning that would take you closer. That might lead you into dead ends, you might have to back out, but it would probably work better than the random one. So there are often different ways of achieving the same goal, where they will achieve the goal, but they might take very different times to do so. Okay. And what about the classic examples of search and sort algorithms that we're expected to cover at Key Stage 3? How do we get across the idea that some of those are better than others? Um, well, searching and sorting is, is explicitly d given as an example in the program of study because these are problems that are very easy to describe. Everybody knows what it means to look for something in the telephone directory or to sort some playing cards into order, but they have a particularly rich taxonomy of possible algorithms to do them. Um, so they form a particularly good example. Oh, and the third thing is they are ubiquitous. The many, many computer programs and computer systems do searching and sorting in one way or another. So for these three reasons, they're very good exemplars. Um, but they are exhi exhibiting a general principle. Now, to take um, uh, searching as a, as a particular example, we, we discussed this a little mm. bit for the telephone book. Um, so when we want to speak a bit more formally about running time, if there were a thousand names in the telephone, or a thousand pages in the telephone book, if, on average, how long would it take me to find Jane Smith using a linear search? Well, it might take me, uh, you know, no more than a thousand pages, clearly, on average, how much? Well, maybe on average about half, right? Sometimes you'll ask me one that occurs early in the alphabet, sometimes late, but after a large number of attempts, a large number of questions, maybe about 500 pages per question. Right? Now, if I do the business about halving each time, how long is that going to take me? Well, I'll go from a book with 10, 1,000 pages to a book with 500 for the right half, for the 250, 125. And in fact, if you keep dividing by two, you'll see that I get to the right page in only 10 examinations. The difference between 1,000 and 10 is really a lot. Does that mean that the algorithm works 100 times faster? No, it's much better than that, <laughs> right? If, it, if the book had a million pages in it, then on average I take 500,000 with the linear algorithm, with the halving every time, I would only take 20. That's much more than 100 times faster. So in fact, the bigger the problem, the more the clever algorithm is faster. And that's one of the essences of the excitement of uh, algorithm design, is by just being smart, you can be so much faster that even a incredibly weedy little computer could <laughs> outperform the biggest supercomputer in the world on a sufficiently large problem. That's quite exciting by being clever.
That's great. Yeah. And what about sort? Comparing things like bubble sort with um, quick sort or merge sort. Oh, sorting is very much the same kind of flavour. You get similar speed up. So uh, one simple way to sort would be uh, to linearly look through to find the smallest item. When you get to the all the way to the end, you will have found the smallest item. Put that at the front. Now, out of the remaining items, linearly look through to find the smallest remaining. Put that at the at the next. Okay. So now you can see how long is that going to take. Well, if there are, if there are 100 items, you're going to look through 100 things, and then through 99 things, and then through 98 things, and then through 97 things. How long is that going to take you? Well, about 50 plus 50 plus 50 plus 50 on average. You know, 100 times. So it's going to be uh, you know there's a quadratic thing going on there. Could we do better than that? Well, yes. Right, and that's the uh, a number of algorithms like quick sort and and merge sort will give you logarithmic complexity. So they'll be as much faster than that simple linear algorithm I described as the uh, binary chop on the telephone directory would be. Um, so searching tends to be a little bit simpler to explain in the first instance. Mm. Right, sorting algorithms are a bit more complicated, but they have the exactly the same sort of performance characteristics. Worst case can be quadratic at least, which is very bad, um, and uh, a good algorithm can be um, logarithmic, which is, or n log n, which is much better, much, much better. Is it worth getting students to implement these as code in Python or Scratch or whatever, or do you get this idea of the algorithm being so much more efficient by just thinking about it? No, not at all. I would definitely implement it first, right? There's nothing that beats the visceral power of, of actually, or you can get children to do this in class. You get, I, I've sat in a class, actually, in an undergraduate lecture room, and on one side of the room, I've had students um, uh, uh, writing up the, the numbers between one and a thousand and, and sort of linearly searching through them and crossing them off. On the other side, I've had them crossing off, you know, the guys on the one side finish much quicker. You just see it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So I would do it with live children first, and the Computer Science Unplugged material has plenty of examples yeah. of doing that. Then I would write some programs, and I would time them, and I would use a spreadsheet to sh plot graphs, and you would see that, you know, the graph of one goes up very slowly, the graph of the other sort of goes through the, 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 the roof, right? That visceral sense is very important, and then I would change the size of the input. So for 10 things, if I'm sorting 10, does it make any difference whether I use a, a, a linear search or a, 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 a binary chop? No, it happens in a flash. Computers are fast, right? You couldn't tell the difference. If I have 100 million items, could I tell the difference? You bet I could. Um, so, and, and so you need to, and seeing that scaling actually in practice on your computer is very visceral. Then you can say, oh, rather than just having to do this all experimentally, could we, could we reason about it, figure out what's going to happen now that you, now you're motivated to do that, because you can see how much difference it makes. So we talk sometimes about time efficiency and space efficiency. I think the examples you've given have illustrated time efficiency really well, but what about space efficiency? What does that mean? And can you give us some examples of, of that? Oh, well, space efficiency is, is, is often a trade-off. So space efficiency is how many bytes of memory does your program take to run? And sometimes um, you um, could imagine that you could write a program that would take a small amount of space but take a lot of time, or perhaps take a lot of space in less time. So um, uh, 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 let's see if I can I can think of an example. I suppose you know, still still working with our our, um, our sorting example. I suppose you could say, well, um, if I was doing this, find the minimum. Imagine that all the inputs were on a tape, right? You fed the tape through the computer, and in you know a constant amount of memory, it can keep the the running maximum, and then it can say, I found the the, the maximum. Uh, you know, spit that out. Right? Now run the tape through again. Right? And I have to remember which one I've already seen, but that's not, that doesn't take too much to remember. So in a relatively small amount of memory, I could probably uh, achieve the algorithm, but at the cost of cycling this thing through many times. Um, so often there's a trade-off between algorithms that take a lot of space but less time, and algorithms that are more time, uh, sort of more space efficient, but in exchange do more repeated computation. That tends to be the trade-off. You tend to use the memory for remembering the results of previous computations. Later on, students learn about big O notation. What does that mean? How would you explain that? I think I'd start by explaining it um, graphically using just plotting graphs. So to stick with our, our um, example of looking up a number in a telephone book, um, I'd plot the graph of if you look at it linearly, uh, how long does it take? And you just just uh, and you'll find it comes out as a straight line, right? If there's if there's uh, uh, ten thousand elements that you're looking through, it'll take you ten thousand seconds. If or maybe five thousand seconds if if one look takes a second on average. If there's a hundred thousand elements, it'll take you uh, you know a hundred thousand seconds or maybe half that on average. Um, if it's a uh, if you do the uh, divided in half each time, then you will see that the graph goes up much less quickly. 
And then, so I plot those graphs to begin with, and then I'd say, well, how much less quickly, right? So, um, in fact, the running time of the, the, the linear look, well, it's going to take, um, if there are n elements, uh, if there are 10 elements, it's going to take me 10 looks maximum. If there are 100 elements, 100 elements maximum. 1,000 elements, 1,000 lookups maximum, right? So, how many, if there's n elements, how many lookups maximum? n, of course, yeah. right? So, now we say that's, a, um, uh, that's an order um, n algorithm because it takes uh, on order n, uh, it takes about n steps, maybe two n, maybe half n. Right? Which we write as big O n. That's right. We yeah. then notationally write okay. that as big O of n. Yes. Now then, uh, with the the uh, halving each time thing, now we have to do a little bit of work to think how many times are we going to be able to halve a number before we get to one, right? So if we take a thousand, we halve it, we halve it, we halve it, we halve it. When do we get to one? Answer it's about ten. And now you need to do a little bit of mathematics to say, actually, what is going on here is logarithms, right, or powers of two. Mm. So that's actually quite a nice little, you know, segue into, into maths, yes. right? Um, but then you come, come back, okay, so on average, the number of steps for n elements is log to the base 2n. Um, and, and so we say it's big O of log to the base 2n. The reason we use the big O thing is because it doesn't really matter very much for this purposes whether it's, um, whether we take for the linear algorithm, whether it's n steps or half n steps or two n steps, right? Those constant factors, so-called, will be completely dominated by this difference between linear and logarithmic as the input size grows, right? So you might tell me, here's an algorithm that takes a hundred times log n steps to get the answer, and here's a different algorithm that takes only one times n steps uh, to get the answer, well, okay, so the one times n sounds better than the hundred times log n, at least for small n's, but when n gets big, log n wins every time. So that's why big O notation sort of suppresses deliberately the constant factors. So there's a, you know, I would think one would do this by dialogue, explanation with graphs, and exploring what would happen by building tables as numbers get very large. And I would do things like say, all right, so, you, you know, team A, you have an algorithm that works in, you know, one times n. Team B, you have an algorithm that works in a million times log n. That sounds much worse, doesn't it? Okay, what n makes team B win? Yeah, that's, I'd go about in that kind of way, I think. So does an algorithm have to give an exact answer? Is that absolutely necessary? Oh, well, no. Um, so, uh, typically, uh, we, we write algorithms, we do have an exact answer in mind. Please look up the, the, um, uh, the you know, Jane Smith and tell me for sure if she's there or, or not there. Uh, but there's a whole very interesting class of algorithms called randomized algorithms that give kind of only probabilistic guarantees on the result. I'll, I'll give you an example of one, but they're so beautiful. So, um, it was uh, invented by a guy called uh, Michael Rabin based on um, early work, and it answers the following question. Is this number prime, or is it composite? Composite meaning it's the product of two factor, two or more factors. Now, that's a very important question to ask, answer in cryptography, because in cryptography we need to be able to come up with very large prime numbers. Now, of course, one way to answer this question might be just factorize the thing, right? But if the number has, you know, 10,000 digits, factorizing it is really hard. In fact, it's not just linear, it's not even quadratic, it's not even cubic, it's exponentially hard, it's really, really, really hard. It's what we call NP complete. So you might think, uh, you know, we're stuck. But what Rabin found was a, a very clever, clever algorithm that does the following. It will very quickly be able to tell you, uh, it, will, it, will, it will run fast and it will tell you either it's definitely composite, that it, it is the definitely the product of two or more other numbers, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. Um, or it will say, I don't know, right? But if, it, if the number is composite, it will say so with probability at least three quarters. Now, when I say probability, the algorithm takes as its input the number you're testing and a randomly generated number, right? And then it will say, uh, with, with probability three quarters, if it's composite, it'll say it's composite, and otherwise they say, don't know, right? So now imagine you run this once. Well, you're saying, is this number prime? And the algorithm says, well, I don't know. Well then, with probability, you know, one, um, there's only a probability of a quarter that, it, that, that if you said it's definitely prime, it could be wrong. But what if you run it again, right, with the different random numbers as the input, again with probability a quarter. So now there's, if you say, if it says no twice, there's only a probability of one sixteenth that the number is actually composite 
but you're going to say it's prime. If you run it three times, it's 1 over 4 times 4 times 4. If you run it four times, one over four times, four times four. In other words, it's one over four to the minus k. I mean, that's ri <laughs> now. So if you run it, say, a hundred times, then uh, the probability, of, oh, and it says no on each occasion, it says I don't know on each occasion, then it, the probability is that it's prime. And the probability of, of being wrong is there, but it's very, very small, like one in two to the hundred, which is like uh, smaller than the chance that this entire building will collapse through some engineering calculation, or I'll be run over by a bus on the way home, or this camera will explode <laughs> due to some battery failure. I mean, when probabilities get small enough, there are many other things in life we yeah. should worry more about than the algorithm being wrong. So what's amazing about this algorithm is it runs really, you can run it a hundred times in a fraction of a second, um, and if it says the, um, the answer is the thing's prime, you have many other things you should worry about, but it's not definite. It's just so unimaginably unlikely that it's wrong that you're good to go. Which is good enough. Uh, yeah. that's, those, these, this class of algorithm is called randomized algorithms and it's a whole beautiful area of computer science that I would love you know, school children to have, you know, to know exists and know an example or two. Mm. Finally, one of the great unsolved problems in computer science is this, this notion of P versus NP. What does that mean and why is that important? Yes, yeah, so this is, this is uh, just an amazingly exciting and beautiful problem that computer science came across and, and it's exciting and beautiful because it's very simply stated and yet nobody knows the answer. So, and you could, you know, you can be famous forever if you solve this. So any school pupil who solves this uh, and who knows, they might, will be famous forever. So here's, here's the thing. Uh, these are, we know algorithms that, are, that work in linear time, or perhaps in quadratic time, that is proportional to the square of the size of the input, or perhaps proportional to the cube of the size of the input. Let's say the input of size n, so it might be n squared, n cubed, n to the fourth, n to the fifth. But some algorithms are so expensive that they take two to the n, that is they're exponentially in size of the input. What that means is that if you make the input one bigger, the algorithm will take twice as long one bigger, it'll take twice as long again. So you've only got to add 10 more, it'll take a thousand times as long, no matter how powerful your computer. Now these algorithms are essentially intractable, that is, for any realistic size of input. There is no computer in the world, or indeed the universe, that could possibly address them, right? Now, uh, these are called um, problems in uh, NP, NP complete problems, right? So they take exponential time to run. Problems in P take polynomial time to run, things like n, n squared, n cubed, n to the fourth, and so forth. Now, uh, it turns out that there's a, nobody knows if there's a, um, um, or, or there's a particular class of algorithms which are called NP-complete that we believe take exponential time, but nobody has proved that they take exponential time. It's just that nobody knows uh, a way to say they definitely do, but nobody has demonstrated a way to do them in polynomial time. So it's a big unsolved problem. And not only that, but there's not just one algorithm that's in this category of it take, we think it takes exponential time, but maybe a very clever person will find a polynomial time algorithm. There's millions and millions of algorithms. If you solve one of them, then you solved all the others, but you could convert all the al others into the one, right? So you if you've got algorithm A, you convert it into algorithm B, and then you solve that in polynomial time, now you're good to go. So these class of algorithms are called NP-complete. So, and nobody knows whether these NP-complete algorithms can be done in polynomial time. Um, and in fact, things like the security of cryptography depends on this, right? If you prove that, uh, you know, demonstrate a polynomial time for these algorithms, immediately, you know, the NSA will go into a sort of brain meltdown because all of cryptography depends on the intractability in this exponentially expensive sense of these problems. Uh, so I, I, I bought with me this, this uh, <laughs> lovely book by Gary and Johnson, which is very old now, but it's a sort of classic text on this subject, but for the sake of its lovely cartoons in which it says, so, so here is some um, uh, a man who's coming to his manager to say, managers asked him to write an algorithm to do something, and he says, I can't find an efficient algorithm. I can only find an exponential time one, which is essentially infeasible. And he says, in the cartoon one, he says, I can't find an efficient algorithm. I guess I'm just too dumb. It would be much better if he could say, I can't find an efficient algorithm because no such algorithm is possible. But despite decades of effort, nobody knows if this is true. But it's a lot better for him if he can say, I can't find an efficient algorithm, but neither can this incredible array of Nobel Prize winning smart people, right? Now you've got some reason to suppose this is a difficult problem. And that's the, that's the, uh, that means that he's proved that his algorithm is in the NP-complete class. So there you go. <laughs> but the other thing just to say is, but, but in, in closing, is that NP-complete problems already, although they are intractably hard to solve exactly, mm. 
we may be able to find very good approximation algorithms for them. So we should not give up. So classic example, traveling salesman problem, right? Uh, salesman wants to, he's got 20 cities to visit. You know how far apart each of the cities are, uh, where the roads are. Find a path that goes through every city at least once that has the minimum number of miles. That is an NP complete problem. Nobody knows a, a way to solve it exactly and find the minimum that's faster than exponential time. But we know some very good approximate algorithms that almost always give extremely good answers that, you know, you think it would be hard to beat that, um, that run very fast. Right, so to say to get the perfect answer is, in, you know, essentially impossible as far as we know. Um, but to get an approximate answer that may be very, very close to the perfect answer, may be entirely tractable. And so there's this whole class alongside randomization algorithms, which are one way of getting algorithms that don't give you the answer. Right, these approximation algorithms for computationally intractable problems are another very interesting class of algorithms that give you not the answer but something that is essentially good enough for practical purposes. Do you think we'll find a solution, we'll find a polynomial solution to NP-complete problems or prove that we can't? Uh, I don't think we're going to do either of those things in my lifetime. <laughs> okay. um, but it's a very sort of fertile research aspect. It's, it's like one of those Mount Everests of computer science, which the act of climbing it, you know, and dying in the attempt and falling <laughs> down crevasses has been incredibly productive for exploring the, you know, the intellectual design space of computer science. But I would, would be quite astonished if, uh, I'd be astonished if anybody proved that P equals NP. Okay. I would not be quite so astonished if somebody proved that they were different, rather like the four color map theorem. We were very confident the yes. four color map theorem was true. And finally, you know, Andrew Wiles proved it. But it would still be a monumental accomplishment. If it happens in my lifetime, I will be surprised and excited. That's excellent. Thank you ever so much for your time this afternoon. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, it's been a very great, great pleasure talking to you. I just would like to, uh, you know, convey the sense of excitement about the sort of the intellectual adventure of computer science. It's not just about sort of mundane, uh, you know, hacking Java programs to pop up windows. There's this amazing idea that you might um, you might be able to create out of pure thought stuff you know the, in this world of algorithms and a structures things that have never existed before and that are very very smart and do things that uh, uh, you know that, that an, an ounce of you know smartness in design may overcome uh, you know may be more important than any amount of programming cleverness right you can get that algorithm and those data structures built they work very closely together mm. there's a huge leverage in that and they there's this wonderful exciting design space that computer scientists have explored and that I hope that uh, children who go through the new computing curriculum will, you know, will experience the wonder of. That's great. You mention NP-complete algorithms. Or is it the algorithm that's NP-complete or is it the problem that's NP-complete? Oh, that was a slip of the tongue, right? <laughs> In fact, it's the whole point. These problems are NP-complete, right, in that they're all interconvertible. But the whole point is we don't know if there's an algorithm that might implement that problem, that might solve that problem, that is in fact polynomial time. But right? as we've discussed before, there may be many algorithms to solve the same problem. And the whole question about NP completeness is, does there exist a polynomial time algorithm to solve that NP complete problem? Yeah, so very good. Thank you for picking me up on that. Thank you.